Good morning, Hope Christian Church. Would you stand? It's a good day to worship the Lord together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much strong? The King above all kings Who shakes the whole With holy thunder Who leaves his breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing Without hope, no place to begin. 
Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your
knowing that we have no strength in ourselves, no, no power in and of ourselves to hold ourselves secure in your hand, but you do. You are strong to save and you are a good savior. And so this morning we look to you with joy and thanksgiving for what you've done for us, but also for our future hope, knowing that we rest secure in your hand. We trust you this morning and pray that you be glorified this morning through everything we do. Be with us today as we hear your word preached. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, you may be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning, it's good to welcome you here today. My name is Bob, I'm one of the pastors on staff here. It's good to have you here today. It's good that you're watching online too. Thank you for joining us today. Let me tell you what's going on in the church. A lot going on here, for instance, Easter, that's coming up sooner than you know. And our celebration plans are all set. I wanna go over those with you uh, this morning so that you'll know and you can invite friends, family members, and neighbors to come. It all starts with an Easter egg hunt. That's going to be on Saturday, April 1st at 10 o'clock here at the church. At least 10,000 Candy-filled eggs will be all around the church for our kids to find. We're going to have three bounce houses here in the worship center. We're going to have crafts. We're going to have cookie decorating. All kinds of fun for the Easter egg hunt on April 1st at 10 o'clock. So that's how our celebration starts. And then on Friday, we have our Good Friday uh, service. Uh, that's our annual service on April 7th. And we'll have extended worship. We'll have a special time of celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And then we'll have a message about the love of God expressed through the sacrifice sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, for us. That'll be on Good Friday. And then our Easter services. We have four Easter services this year. We'll start with our Saturday night service at seven o'clock, and then we'll have our three regular Sunday services on Easter Sunday. Those times are nine and 10.30, the one you're here now, and noon. So nine, 10.30, and noon on Sunday, seven o'clock on Saturday night for our Easter services. On your way in, you may have received uh, one of these. These are our invite cards for you. You can put these up on your refrigerator to remind you of all of the events that we've got going on for Easter here. And you can pick up some of these at the information desk, maybe a stack of them to pass out to your friends and your uh, relatives and anyone you want to invite for our Easter celebration here at Hope. Please uh, get some of these and pass them out. It's a, it's a great way to fulfill our tell mission here at Hope. So that's what's happening for Easter. Baptism at Hope. Our next Baptism at Hope class is coming up next Sunday. That is the 12th. We'll We'll have that after the third service. We'll start right around 1.15. A light lunch will be served, and we'll talk about baptism and the meaning of baptism and why we do it the way we do it here at Hope. You can get all of your questions answered if you're thinking about baptism. A lot of people have signed up so far, and if you'd like to come, please let us know. Register on the events page at hopechristianchurch.com to let us know that you'll be coming to that. Women's Conference. Our Women at Hope Ministry is going to hold a conference called The Fullness of God. That'll be on Saturday, March 25th, ladies. That's coming up fast. Our featured guest will be author and teacher Erica Wiggenhorn. She wrote the study that our women are currently going through. It's on the book of Ezekiel. It's an awesome study. Erica does a really fine job. She's going to be coming here from Arizona for the conference, March 25th, Fullness of God. Seats are filling up fast. I checked the numbers this morning. We have 40 seats left. We have room for 250 women and we only have 40 seats left. All right. So ladies, you're getting on it. Please uh, go to our website at hopechristianchurch.com. Sign up on the events page for the Fullness of God Women's Conference that is coming up. Those are the announcements for today. Pastor Mark is here to bring the message as we continue in the flesh.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. Oh, coughing in public, huh? That's not allowed anymore, right? I feel like the weather needs to make up its mind, right? I, I kind of knocked off the gunk this morning when I woke up. Well, thank you for being here this morning. I'm excited to take part in this sermon series called The Flesh. Uh, in this series, we're looking at works of the flesh from our list in Galatians 5. And in this series, Neil has defined for us the flesh, that's our sin nature. And because even though we are new creations in Christ Jesus, we are still attached to the flesh and we still have a sin nature and we still struggle and wrestle with that nature. And we are looking at this list from Galatians 5 that points out specific ways that we struggle. I want to read, as we get started, I want to read our reference list this morning. Galatians 5 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A couple things I want to point out as we get into it today. I want to highlight for us to keep in mind as we go through this. First, what is our theme for the year? All right, very good. This room did better. This side did better than that side. That's okay, though. I'm not going to hold it against you. Live by the Spirit. That's in the first verse up here. But I say walk by the Spirit. Another way of saying live by the Spirit. That's the theme of our church this year that Neil set up for us. The second thing I want to highlight that Neil mentioned earlier in the series, and I really appreciate that he did, is that Paul says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are... Your turn. Evident, right. They're evident. They're obvious. We should be able to recognize them and see them easily. Sometimes when we think about these lists and we think about our sin, we kind of play this chess and we kind of work around certain things on this list. And we, well, that doesn't affect me. No, I, I, my intentions are better than that. That's not quite me. I wouldn't go so far as impurity. And we lie to ourselves. Even though it's obvious to someone else, we lie to ourselves and we are in denial. Those are two things. This is quite the list that we're looking at. But keep those in mind as we go through today. Our list here in verse 19 and 20 and 21, the works of the flesh. We're going to look at two, uh, two more of these works. Last week, Neil brought us up through enmity and strife. So we'll continue with jealousy. And then we're also going to pull envy up and do envy today as well, because jealousy and envy are closely related sins. Let's consider these two specifically. Uh, something that's, that's come up already in this series uh, is the desire behind the sin, the desire behind the work of the flesh. When we think of works of the flesh, we typically think of outworkings, uh, things that are displayed to the world that they can see. But really, these two, jealousy and envy, you don't kind of go out in public and see people envying, do you? These two things are purely desire, and yet they're called sin. So let's think about this. Up in verse 17 that we already read, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So we have to consider this desire versus works because we make that dichotomy in our minds sometimes. But really that isn't fair because the desire is a sin just as much as the work. The desire is a work. What I desire to do is not always what I actually do. That's the language Paul uses in Romans 7, we're very familiar with. It's also kind of the human condition to some degree. We don't always do what we desire. Some of you desire to be in Cabo right now with your feet in the sand. But it's not what you're actually doing. Of course not. The things you want to do at the end of this verse, the things you want to do, basically Paul, he's not saying the things you want to do is in the things you desire to do. He's saying the things you want to do is in, this is what you want to do to live by the Spirit. This is what you should be doing. 
That's what he means there in that phrase. Paul is expanding on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' fulfillment of the law. You've heard it said, if not to murder, but if you call your brother a fool, you've murdered him in your heart. You've heard it said not to commit adultery, but if you've lusted after someone, you've already committed adultery. Jesus expands it so we understand that it's about the desire itself. Neil talked about this a little bit last week. We talked about longings. Longing for the world versus longing for godly things. So let's get into these two desires, envy and jealousy. And we'll start with jealousy. Jealousy is this. A strong feeling of possessiveness. A strong feeling of possessiveness, of ownership. Often caused by the possibility that something that we own or we think ought to own or belong to us, is about to be taken away. What do we think of when we think of jealousy typically? Where does your mind go? My mind goes to the dating scene. Or our spouse, our boyfriend, our girlfriend, our significant other. We're jealous over them. We can be. It's a tight clinging to something or someone that leads to toxic, sinful behavior. Now, Scripture has basically two uses for the word jealousy. And you can see the word zealous is the Greek word that's translated jealousy most often. I included that. And the first use of the word jealousy in scripture is a passionate commitment. A passionate commitment. Now that doesn't sound bad, does it? In fact, nothing negative is even implied there. A passionate commitment to something can be a very good thing. God calls himself jealous. We know that. Exodus 20, this is the Ten Commandments. This is the commandment against idolatry. You shall not bow down to idols or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Elsewhere, God actually gives himself the title of jealous. This reflects our first definition for jealous. It's a passionate commitment of God to his people. Now, I included that Greek word zealous, so you can hopefully see the the other side of that word. We get jealous from zealous, but we also get the English word zealous. Somebody who's zealous for something is passionately committed to that thing. So this is all well and good, right? How is this a work of the flesh? Why are we talking about this? Well, we have to consider, can we demonstrate jealousy in this way for a moment? And we need to be careful here because I'm not, I'm not so sure I have landed on an answer. In Corinthians, Paul talks about a divine jealousy that he has for the Corinthian church. But even when he says it, you can almost read like the air quotes when he says it, like I have a divine jealousy for you. It's a tough one. Can we pursue this divine jealousy? You see, God is jealous for us because we are rightfully his. And when we demonstrate jealousy, it's for something that's not rightfully ours. It's typically something that's rightfully God's. Because what's rightfully God's? Everything. The Old Testament prophet Hosea demonstrated this. God told the prophet Hosea to go after this woman named Gomer. Gomer was a prostitute that worked in a brothel. And he said, go and make her your wife. And he did. And multiple times she went back to her way of life and betrayed Hosea. And God would say, go back and get her. And that demonstrates God's passionate commitment to us, his his jealousy over us to go and do what it takes to to redeem us and come and get us. Nothing is rightfully ours. Even Paul knew that when he was talking to the Corinthians. The Corinthians weren't his because he mentored them and established that church and discipled them. They were God's ultimately. God loves us with a passionate zeal because ultimately jealousy in our lives doesn't come out as beautiful as the love of God. In fact, it's pretty much the opposite because that same Corinthian church that Paul felt this divine jealousy for had to be rebuked because of its own inner fighting and jealousy. First Corinthians says this, even now you are not ready for you're still of the flesh. For while there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? 
Corinthian church struggled with division. In this same section of scripture, Paul is, is, is rebuking them because they, there are different sects of people in the church that like different leaders in the church. So when they, when they would preach, Apollo and Paul, different giftings that these men have, they were causing division. Jealousy leads to strife, arguing, fighting. In our own churches, especially, we think we own God's church or you're a member of the church and you tithe and give to the church so you have the right to tell the church what to do. And you get upset when the church doesn't do it your way. And you pick up your toys and you go down the road. Jealousy among pastors is a very real thing. Why isn't my church growing? Why isn't my church 3,000 people? Why isn't my church 10,000 people? American consumerism has led us to believe bigger and greater is bigger and greater in the kingdom of God. That's not the case. Jealousy is demonstrated divinely by God. It's demonstrated brokenly by us. I think our time is, is better spent today considering the second definition of jealousy in Scripture. And that definition is closer to the second topic in our list. The second definition on the screen was this, self-destructive possessiveness, similar to envy. That's the second use of jealousy in Scripture. It's similar to envy. And we tend to link those two together a lot of times as well. I'll define envy as this, a desire for another's possessions, positions, or proclivities. And I, so some of you are saying right now, Mark, it seems like you forced in that last word to keep the alliteration. And I have to say you're partially right, <laughs> but it fits and it works and we're going to get there. And if nothing else, that's what you'll remember from today. <laughs> Envy, though, is something that we, we want, but we don't have, and God hasn't given it to us. And I'll add to that a resentful feeling, either toward God or toward another person, because we don't have what we want. It's an unsettled spirit. Maybe our thoughts are even consumed by it. We wake up thinking about it. We spend our day thinking about it. We go to sleep thinking about it. This desire for possessions, Material goods, our stuff. This is easy to understand. Houses, cars, golf clubs, clothes, electronics, gadgets, toys, material things that we look at and we don't have and we desire it to the point that we are resentful. Or maybe it's positions, jobs, or even just workplace advantages, statuses, marital statuses. I'm not married, but my neighbor is. I'd really like to be married. Or I am married and I really would not like to be married anymore. <laughs> Social statuses, opportunities, societies, boards that our neighbor is a part of, upbringings. We're envious because our neighbor was born with a silver spoon in their mouth and we've struggled up to this day. Positions in the community, Friendship circles, achievements, education, initials after your name. Maybe family position or status. I'll say this with all tenderness and compassion because grief is a complex process, but grief will lead to envy if we're not careful. We lose our loved one and we look at our neighbor and said, well, how come they didn't lose their spouse? How come they didn't lose their child? How come they didn't lose their parents? And I have to go the rest of my life without that person I love. It leads to resentment. Or maybe we even envy the grief process itself. They lost their parent a year ago and they seem to be fine. Why can't I get over it? We even envy ourselves. We envy ourselves from another time, right? It's called nostalgia. A couple weeks ago, I was playing Super Mario World. 
don't know about you, but the Super Nintendo was my jam. Like that was my era, that's my sweet spot. And I got the urge to play this game that I played as a kid. And you can pretty much play any game you want nowadays. And so I'm sitting there playing Super Mario World and my nine-year-old son comes up and he loves video games. And he's, he's like, what are you doing, dad? It's like, I'm playing this game from my childhood. He's like, why? <laughs> I was like, nostalgia. He's like, what's nostalgia? <laughs> I was like, it's a good feeling you get from when you remember something from, from your childhood. And he thought about it for a second and he goes, you know, I think one day I'm gonna have nostalgia. <laughs> I was like, yes, you are. This is the best time of your life. You need to realize how good it is. That's the message for anyone under 12 to hear. But we envy other eras of our own life. Man, I'm not in college anymore. That was the best time of my life. I was in shape and I had friends. <laughs> I wasn't saying me, I was saying others. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Proclivities. Proclivities means tendencies. How other people are wired, even spiritually, spiritual giftings that we get envious of. God hasn't gifted me in this way to serve or even to teach. That's what I want to do. Why wouldn't God give me this gift so I could counsel this person and know what to say? Why wouldn't God give me the personality that I wanted? With the advent of all these personality tests, they can be helpful, yes, but they point out your strengths. What else do they point out? They point out your weaknesses. There was a time not long ago where I was researching, can an introvert change to an extrovert? I'm an introvert. And I said, God, wouldn't it make more sense if I was an extrovert being in the role you've put me in? Don't I know a little bit better than you? or entrepreneurship, I have envied that in the past. I don't understand you people. <laughs> I don't understand the, the desire to take on the risk of starting a small business. Some of you are like, you've already done one this morning. <laughs> I don't get that, but I envy it because I wish I had that, that, that drive. I just don't. Or fitness. That tendency, that proclivity to wake up at five in the morning and go to the gym and focus on your health and fitness. Because what does that lead to? Our proclivities lead to opportunities given to certain people with certain proclivities. Or if it is fitness, you tend to have a better body that we are envious of. But spiritually, professionally, personally, all of these lead to envy. It's this desire to not be able to look at someone else and say, good for them, good for what God has blessed them with and be happy for them. It's an unsettledness. It's an uneasy feeling saying, God, why didn't you give that to me? It turns a want into a need. Jealousy and envy fold up into covetousness, the 10th commandment. If you're observant today, you notice that I brought a mug up on the stage. I want to show you this mug. So last fall, I preached a sermon on the imprecatory Psalms. And those are the Psalms that the author wishes harm on his audience. And I made the joke that these aren't the verses that you typically see on a coffee mug. <laughs> and so uh, a member of our church made me a mug and gave it to me as a Christmas present. One of our better members. <laughs> um, <laughs> it says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. <laughs> now, that's not all. She went ahead and put my picture on it. <laughs> of me actually giving that sermon and reading this verse. Why do I show you this? I wanted to, in a controlled environment, let you know what envy feels like. Because this is the only one and you're not getting it. <laughs> this will be behind glass after the sermon. 
but you can already feel, right, that resentment building for me because I own this and you don't. <laughs> That's silly. Where does jealousy and envy lead? James says this, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It's earthly, it's unspiritual, it's demonic. For where selfish and, or jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. James is telling us the picture of jealousy and envy and what it leads to. He says it's unspiritual. We're trying to live by the spirit this year. This is the opposite. In fact, in verse 13, you could argue that he gives us a straight up definition for living by the spirit. Showing works in the meekness of wisdom in 13. Showing your works in the meekness of wisdom. That could be a straight up definition for living by the spirit. But what does it lead to? Every vile practice. Every vile practice. And we are going through a list of vile practices in this series. James is saying jealousy and envy are gateway sins. If you allow them to fester, if you allow them to exist, it's going to lead to everything else you can imagine. It's a gateway into greater and more sin. So what do we do about it? James has already told us a little bit from chapter one. He's shed some light on it. Let's go back two chapters to James one. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So lured and enticed by his own desire. Lord, that's a fishing term. We understand that. The New American Standard translates that as being carried away. I love that translation. We are carried away by our own desire and we're enticed in our own mind. We're convinced. We're carried away and convinced this is the right way. This is the thing to do. This is the thing I want. I have a right to this. I should have this. God should give this to me. Five years ago, I got to go to Kenya with a mission team here from the church. And toward the end of the week, uh, we had a night off and we got to visit this giant shopping mall uh, that would, on certain nights, they would have this kind of, kind of like an open air market in the top floor of their parking garage where vendors would come in and kind of set up shop of uh, kind of all the regional vendors who would sell homemade stuff or crafts, that sort of stuff. And it was a cool thing. It's kind of like trunk or treat. You know, you walk around trunk to trunk. We would walk around vendor to vendor and kind of see what they have and maybe buy some stuff. So we got to visit this open air market and uh, we're going to it. It's up on the top floor of this parking garage. We're climbing the steps and I'm kind of in the front and um, we get up to the top and come out the doors and there's this group of men that are kind of hanging out at the top quite a few men, probably more men than we had in our group. And they immediately start talking to us. They start coming up and asking us questions. What are you doing? Where are you from? And, you know, I was just like, well, we're, you know, we're here with a team from the States and we're with Missions of Hope International. And the guy talking to me, he's like, yeah, yeah, I know them. Yeah, they're, they're over in Mathari, right? Yeah, like they, they, they sent me here to help you guys. And doe-eyed, naive me, and never been out of the country before. He's like, all right, that's great. What are we going to do? And immediately they start talking to each member of our team and we started kind of being carried away. Now what they were doing is they were vendors and they were trying to get us to go to their store to buy their stuff. But we were suddenly in this position where all of us were just suddenly being kind of carried away, being swept up. Then Bob, he was the leader of the trip. He's like at the end of the tale. He finally gets up and he's been, to, he's been to this place many times. He sees what's going on. He just like immediately takes control of the situation and just starts grabbing all of us. And he's throwing Kenyan nationals over the edge and it's just crazy. <laughs> but he pulled us in, he reeled us in and kind of put the situation back under control. But that's a perfect picture of what is going on when we're Lord and we're carried away. All right, I'll go with you. That's, that's, that sounds, what do you have? That sounds great. I'll take two. 
But look at this in my example, in my analogy. The men that were talking to us and carrying us away, in that analogy, it wasn't Satan. Who's carrying us away? It says our own desire. It's our self. We allow ourselves to be carried away. The desire hits and we aren't careful. We don't consider it for a moment and we're carried away. Poof, we're gone. James is telling us here the path to put the works of the flesh to death. And I'm gonna go backwards here. I'm gonna start at the end. He starts with death to death. We have to put death to death itself. That's the work of Christ. That's why he came. Ultimately to put death itself to death. That's the final enemy to be defeated. The works of the devil and death itself will be defeated. It's Christ's final work, but it's also the final expression of our sin, whatever it is. Look at Cain and Abel. Cain, envious, jealous of Abel, killed Abel. Joseph, envied by his brothers, sold to slavery to be left for dead. King Saul attempted murder of David because he knew he was the new king. Death to death is the final step, but death to sin is before it. Death to the sin itself. This is typically where we hang out. This is what we think we should be, where we should be hanging out for sanctification. But it just tends to be behavior control. If we work hard at sinning less, ultimately we will just sin less. And we don't go back far enough. Our problem is we don't go back far enough. We don't ultimately go all the way back and put to death the desire. Yeah, James says desire is what carries us away and entices us. If we continue reading in Galatians 5 from our list, after our list, Paul is going to affirm what James is saying. He says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the spirit, there it is, let us also keep in step with the spirit and not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I've already said that these two works of the flesh are rooted in desire and they're gateway sins to other greater sins. We have no choice but to kill it at its roots. Paul is saying we don't just crucify the sin, but we crucify the desire. This is tough because this is easier said than done. We pop our heads up at the top of the stairs and poof, we are carried away. We don't even stop to think about it. Learning your desire and putting it to death. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says we are to deny ourselves. Let me, say, let me say this, let me make this clear. It's not a death to all desire. It's a death to fleshly desire. Taken to the extreme, removing all desire, that's Buddhism. That's what Buddhism teaches. I'm talking about removing the fleshly desire that's not God glorifying. Because God wants us to have desires. He wants them to be properly focused. As I wrap this up here, let's, let's look at Psalm 37 for our application. The author here says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. They will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. How do we crucify desire, particularly envy and jealousy today? How do we not get carried away? Five things I wanna look at here quickly from this, this section of scripture. One is to identify your envy and what triggers it. He starts by saying, fret not or worry not. Don't worry, that's a command. And don't be envious of wrongdoers. You can't not do that. You can't follow that command if you don't know what is triggering you and what you're envious of. Almost all of us probably know what it is because I said the sins of the flesh are what? Evident. We just don't want to admit it to ourselves and say it out loud. 
going to the market triggers you. Identify it, say it out loud. Understand what you're putting in your mind that triggers you. Understand how many advertisements you see a day that are literally designed to make you unhappy, to make you unsatisfied and incomplete without whatever product they are selling. Because ultimately envy and jealousy is us not being happy with, God's, with what God's given us. I was uh, eating lunch the other day with the guys in the office and Neil looked at me and he said, did you get emails from Taco Bell? <laughs> it made me think of how many things we see during a day that a hundred years ago we never would have seen. The saturation of just marketing. Science behind it to understand how the brain works to make decisions. I said, yes, of course I get emails from Taco Bell. <laughs> Two, the second thing, hold on to the P's with a loose grip. When I say the P's, I mean your possessions, positions, and proclivities. Hold on to the P's with a loose grip. In our second verse here, the author says, they will soon fade like the grass. He is quick to remind us that everything is temporary, especially the three P's. Everything that we hold with a firm grip and we put above the glory of God is soon to fade away. Everything we put above relationship with the Lord and relationship with others is soon to fade away. That beamer that you just have to have is one day gonna not exist. That job that you have to get is one day not gonna be a thing. The proclivities and the tendencies that your neighbor is wired with will soon one day be a thing of the past. That's why when we have possessions and we come across somebody that needs them, we have a loose grip on it. Here, take these. And that job promotion does come up. It's not wrong to go for them. The other man gets it. That's good. I know God has something for me. This was his plan. Or when we feel, man, I am introverted. God, why didn't you make me an extrovert? You made me an introvert because your ways are higher than mine and you know so much more than I do. Three, remove yourself from the equation if possible. It means don't go to the market. Don't go hang out with that group of businessmen that all they talk about is how to get ahead. Or that group of moms maybe that all they talk about is their clothing, their makeup, and how big their house is. I'm not saying these things are wrong inherently, but I'm saying they're wrong whenever we participate them and they cause envy and resentment in our hearts. Conversely, the author here is saying, do good, dwell in the land. He's not saying remove yourself from the, from the world, from the whole situation. We're not gonna be able to remove ourselves completely. If you struggle with envy in the workplace, you just can't go and quit your job tomorrow. No, instead do good. Do good. Encourage the one who gets the promotion. Say, hey man, I was going for that. You got it. I'm, I'm happy for you. Praise God. Literally go up to them and say something to them. Paul told Timothy, godliness with great contentment is great gain. That's a whole other message though. We won't get into that. Four, surround yourself with people who will pull you back. Befriend faithfulness. Take Bob with you. Last week, the great commandment, greatest commandment, love God and love others. Doesn't say love God and love others and love your stuff. Love the three Ps. Relationships should be prioritized over everything. The thing with envy though is this is not something we typically confess. It's not. When we feel that envy and jealousy in our hearts or that resentment, it's kind of hard to share that with somebody. 
Sometimes it seems kind of seems minor, right? It's not that big a deal. Just get over it. But it stews inside of us. It starts to shape our personality. So we don't let it out. We don't tell somebody about it. We don't confess it. Find people in your life that you can talk to and you can confess these things to and you can tell them about your struggle. Drag it out into the light. We've heard that already. But friend, faithfulness. Put people in your lives that are good examples. That's, whose desires and focus isn't on the three Ps. This week on the podcast, Neil mentioned that he doesn't read the news because it made him worry. That's gonna blow some of your minds. <laughs> How do you not read the news? But because he said that, I read the news, I'm taking it on myself to do that because I saw it made me worry. And how many commercials am I filtering in with that, those news that make me want more things? I want the better car, the bigger vacation, the nicer house. Because I've got an example. I'm gonna follow that example as he follows Christ. Who are you surrounding yourself with? Are you befriending faithfulness? Are you befriending the world? Five, the last thing, finally, replace dead desires with delight in the Lord. This is how the author in, in the Psalm says it in verse four, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now that seems kind of backwards, right? Mark, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you your desires. So if I delight in the Lord properly, he'll give me that beamer. No, this is saying delight yourself in the Lord and he will show you new desires that are for him. He will give your heart new desires to crave him because he's given us everything He's given us himself in the person of Christ. Envy and jealousy really roots all the way back to our unhappiness with God because he's not enough for us. Listen to these lyrics. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. Do you know what song that's from? We just sang it 20 minutes ago. We just sang that. We sat here and sang those words. Listen to them again. He is my joy and my righteousness. He's my freedom. He's my steadfast love, my deep, deep, boundless peace. Are you registering those words as you say them? Let me sit them with our coffee. He's my joy, my goodness, peace. This is the last song, a little more. Our delight is pulled into the things of this world and our delight is not on God. God, thank you for saving us, that was great. Now where's my Beamer? Let me end on this, Proverbs 14. It says, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh. That bumper video. That heart coming back to life gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, and I pray that we delight in you this morning, and those delights replace the dead desires that we have crucified. The envy and the jealousy that we have when we look around we're carried away and enticed. Father, show us this week how to identify our, our, our triggers, to remove ourselves when we can, to befriend faithfulness and put the flesh to death along with its passions and desires. It's in the wonderful name of Christ we pray everything. Amen. We're gonna close our service by sharing a communion together. There's a cup in the seat in front of you and we invite you to participate if you're a faithful follower of Jesus as we follow it by his instruction. And we sit and consider for just a minute our own personal envy and jealousy and where that hits us because it's personal to each and every one of us. Does Jesus take envy seriously? 
Or is he like, oh, that's, that's not, that was not too bad. Just don't get into sexual immorality. Well, the truth is envy is the reason Jesus was crucified. Matthew 27 says this. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they gathered, Pilate said, whom do you want for me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who's called Christ? For Pilate knew that it was out of envy that the, they had delivered him up. Envy leads to death, just like every other sin. You think Jesus doesn't take envy seriously? He was delivered up because of it. Because he was delivered, we have the chance to live a life where we can have life brought back to our flesh. We can put to death the works of the devil. So when we take communion, we remember what Christ did for us. We remember the cross that he took for us, the punishment, the wrath of God that he suffered on our behalf. And he calls us now to root out the desire Root it out, get it out of your life. Leave it at the cross. We take the bread, represents his body. We take the juice that represents his blood. Father, this morning we find our delight in you. Give us more desire for you, Lord. You are our joy and our righteousness, our freedom, our, our steadfast love, our deep, boundless peace. We praise you this morning and we worship you and we are grateful. In the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray this morning, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Have a great week.